Do you see the two giants about to go to war over in Japan? And this one is going to be easy, I'm telling you. What am I talking about? Do you see the other day the article that came out where Swift wants to deploy, uh, they're hoping to deploy their stable coin based system over there with a few banks in Japan? But wait, what happened right here? One day later, Ripple comes out. Brad Garlinghouse, at least this is what I'm seeing this article. A day later, Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse comes out and says, wait a minute. We're coming out with our stable coin in Japan. Now, that's right. Not only is XRP gaining ground with each day as far as its partnerships and its dominance, not XRP outright. I'm talking about like the companies that use XRP, of course. Let me clarify before people get in the comment section. But Ripple, SBI, etc., continuing to spread the dominance of XRP and XRPL in Japan so that in the future, when they're ready to flip the switch, for lack of a better word, it can happen with absolute dominance and without question. Not only is that happening, but now Ripple wants to deploy their stable coin. What we're talking about here is absolute domination, folks. They're not letting Swift breathe anywhere on the globe right now here's why there's such a huge advantage you see even if swift were to deploy their stable coin system which would be highly limited anyway globally speaking how many nations are going to reject a swift based system because they don't want to use them anymore that's been clear so why would the the banks in japan any of them really stick with a system that's going to be highly limited in, in its very essential nature. They would not. While Ripple is going to come in and say, hey, listen, we have this stable coin here is for cheap. We have true global reach. We're neutral. No country is going to reject us. As a matter of fact, they embrace us. Pure dominance is what I expect. I think is what the trajectory of this is. But this article says this. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse sees opportunity for stable coins globally. See, he likes to emphasize that, which is good because it, it, it keeps that idea in people's minds that what we have has true global reach. What we have is the best of the best. We haven't bitten anybody. We haven't backstabbed anybody. We haven't cut anyone out. And that's what makes the XRPL and all the other bank coin companies so potent. One of the many things. It says, particularly in Japan, the company is in the process of launching a stable coin in Japan soon. The executive confirmed to Bloomberg on Friday. There's no coincidences, folk. You don't have Swift come out and say, hey, this is what we're going to do with our stable coin. And then Ripple come right, right behind them. Ripple stomping on them. They're stepping on them. They're trying to. They're, they're, they're doing what they said they wanted to do in the beginning and compete. But instead of just running their mouths which it seems like what a lot of people want. They want to always hear Ripple say, we're going to compete with Swift. We're going to move all the money. They want it, They want people to talk. That's a problem, I think, with today's society. You want to hear things, but really the substance is in actions. I want to see actions. I need them to execute. Get the job done. And right now, it looks like that's what they're doing. You might say to yourself, that's some pretty good news. Mick. That's interesting. Is that all? Absolutely not. Things have been going off lately. I, the timelines are speeding up or something's happening. Major. There's a lot of activity. So, of course, that's not it. That's not all. Wait, what's this? What is this article popping up here? Let's find out. This article was titled XRP Fair Market Value Stands at $4,813. You believe that? You agree with that? I'm going to say it again. Read it one more time. This is what the article says. XRP fair market value stands at $4,813 per Athi and Michnik model, whatever that may be. All right. Look into it for yourself. Make up your own mind. I'm just reading an article and I find this very, very interesting. As a matter of fact, um, it says here, a valuation model by Susan Athi. And Robert Michnik reveals a potential fair market value for XRP, positioning it at an impressive 
five figure price xrp currently trading for 52 cents we know that the whole market was down it looks a little bit green this hour i did briefly just look at the charts like i literally just just went to the charts coin market cap looked and then i came to make this video so <laughs> at that time it looked a little bit green it says here however some suggest this underperformance is due to price suppression from several factors i won't uh, yeah, sure a lot of things are suppressed but i'll say this once you have everything up and running and look, they're still building. Even the guy from the, the Fed said, give the private sector time. It's still early. He literally said that. We've covered that in the video, right? All right. So it's no secret. It's, it's taking time. We were kneecapped for a while. It's still going to take a little bit more time, whether people like it or not. But once the time has come and everything is ready, boom, There's, I don't see any way they're going to suppress this. That's why I firmly believe when the time is right, if everything goes according to plan, right? Because life is life. Everything goes according to plan. Things will happen very quickly. Very, I just don't see any way around it right now. I just don't. Too many big businesses involved, too many banks involved, too much big money involved. There's too many believers behind the scenes of XRP. There's another thing people don't talk about. They try to keep quiet. There's a lot of big money believers. And this is why and, and you, if you want to verify that for yourself, just look at the big the uh, Bitcoin maxis sitting on a ton of capital that have been coming out all this year and say, hey, we're bullish on XRP now. You think that just started? No, they were looking at XRP for a long time, a long time. There's a lot of people like that out there. They just haven't come out and said it. So when the time comes, there's a lot of capital that could possibly could possibly flow into XRP from those pockets as well. Sure. Yeah, that's a nice little sprinkles on top. You know, I'm more here for the interbank payments and real world asset tokenization and B2B cross border money myself. I want that bank money. I think we're going to get it quite easily, to be fair, especially now that Ripple's going after the small banks. But um, that's nice little sprinkles on top. The price could move very, very quickly. That's just a fact. And no, not financial advice. I'm just a humble researcher. Do what you want to do. You got to say that if you have a YouTube channel, you better say that type of stuff. Um. Yeah, I just don't see any way around it, especially with RWA looming. I think that that might happen quicker than everything else. And that's going to be a constant flow because people want to make some money. It's going to be easy, especially with them streamlining everything. It says, however, some suggest this underperformance due to price suppression from several factors that I don't care about. Talk that money to me. Talk nice to me. So it says here, the Athi Michnik model builds its projections on two major drivers. XRP is using cross-border payments and the demand for it as a store of value. That's it? That's it? Listen, Ripple made it clear. They want to go in heavy with RWA. That's major right now. Countless different asset classes with trillions that could be taken and moved across the XRPL. Ripple is respected. Volante Tech is respected. SBI is respected. I could keep going. Uphold said that they have some institutions looking into XRP as well. I can keep going. Right. All right. So that's major. How do you not take that into account? So should these numbers be adjusted? All right. We'll go with this, though. All right. It says here, the model assumes that by 2030, 10% of global transactions would be processed using the XRP ledger. I think the people would settle for even less than that. You know, but let's keep going. 10%. How much is it with 3%? 2%, 4%, people's heads will explode, in my humble opinion. Once again, and that's also, they're just going on like two categories, two variables. They're not even taking into account the RWA. This is additionally, the 10% target also applies to global assets moving to XRP. Okay, so why didn't you say that in the beginning? Additionally, the 10% target also applies to global assets moving to XRP, con contributing to the price surge. The model takes into account XRP's utility for fast borderless transactions along with its, with its ability to be stored, which limits supply and circulation for payments. Wait a minute. Do they break this all the way down? Oh, my word. Oh, wait, did you see this article? Listen, I just glanced over it. They have a screenshot here, which goes into depth. My apologies, article writer, you're cooking. 10% global transactions, 10% global assets, uh, assets move to the XRPL by 2030. Oh, my big, my, my humblest apologies, <laughs> article writer. I better screenshot this little thing and put this in the video if I can remember. This is nice. 
Of course, like I said, I believe we could go with lower and still people's minds would spin. You get to that. Let's listen. I'm just playing the game here. I'm looking at the numbers. They're saying 4,000. I'm going by their numbers. If we were to lower their numbers, I'm not saying this is my number. I'm saying if we lower their numbers. I mean, would the people be mad at a $75 XRP, $100 XRP, $100 XRP? I don't think that they would. And let's going by these numbers, that would just be a start. $75, $100 XRP would just be a start, a beginning. Of course, that all comes after XRP goes through a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, five dollars, ten dollars. Of course. All right. We're not jumping ahead. I'm just using the article that we have at hand. But looking at these numbers. So daily transaction value, 700 billion they have here. Time between transactions. One second. Store of value demand, 550 trillion. That's a store of value demand you're putting down here. Um, XRP <laughs> circulating supply, 6.5 billion. Discount rate, 10%. Time until steady state, seven years. Hmm. And price per XRP, 4,813. Where are... I have to look a little bit deeper into this. Why these numbers specifically? Why? You're like, well, make these set the percentages. Specifically, 700 billion, 550 trillion store, uh, uh, store of value demand. Store of value demand. I mean, if you're talking about RWA coming on to chain, I don't think that value stays there. I don't think that value stays there. I mean, I just don't. I don't. Now, if you're talking, like, you got to clarify that. Do you mean like the banks holding XRP, big businesses holding XRP? Okay, then if you're talking about that, and I don't know about. I see everything being in flow. I'm, I'm looking at the value in, in it being a bridge currency and moving value back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Everything coming on chain, moving off chain, coming on chain, moving off chain, and that being a constant. That's how I'm looking at it. You tell me in the comment section if you're if, if I'm thinking wrong or you think differently than what I'm thinking. I mean, let's put our minds together. Why not? You want to contribute? Why not? According to the evaluation technique, XRP's fair market value sits at a massive four thousand eight hundred and thirteen dollars. A key aspect of this projection revolves around XRP's unique virtuous cycle where an increase in adoption for payments results in a higher price. We will see. We shall see. But that's music to my ears to see such a thing. I'm, uh, that's very exciting. Very, very interesting. I'm glad people are still doing that work. Wait, they elaborate a little bit more. To compute this fair value, Athi and Mishnik assume that daily transaction volume could reach $700 billion. Why? While demand for storing XRP could amount to $53 trillion. Wait, didn't they say a different amount at the top? Am I losing it here? $53 trillion by 2020, by 2030, $53 trillion by 2030. Like I said, I don't think we need that much. To be quite honest, for everything to go boom, I really don't. Um, and I'm, I'm not looking at it as people holding XRP. I think it's going to be in flow. A lot of things are going to be in flow across XRP, Stellar, Algorand, Quant, Flare, um, LCX, Zenfin, Songbird. Songbird has its place. Facts. Just, just how it is. There's always going to be a new DAP2 test on Songbird. Do people not understand that? But that's a that's their uh, live money testing round that there's always going to be a new dap there's always going to be a new update which means they always need to have songbird on ready to have some iteration of their offering on songbird to be tested and updated first before they roll it out on flare but then let's that leads us to flare flare also was in the game as a connector chain link is in the game solana is in the game and i think that you're going to see constant flow between all of those they're going to congeal so much into the future you won't be able to tell not you but normal people won't be able to be able to tell one from the other they won't know they just drive the Lexus. They just drive the the the, uh, the Challengers and Maybachs. They don't look under the hood like that, the typical person. They don't know how to change an alternator or what the alternator does. You open up, you pop that engine and say, what does this do right here? They don't even know what it is. They're looking at the serpentine belt. They have no idea. They don't care, right? These are the engine pieces. They're going to flow together and work as an engine. And the people won't care how it works, but I think you're going to get flow across all of them. That's how you get pure global domination. And um, I think they pitch a shutout. I do. I don't see the legacy system catching up with them. Um, so where the price goes, who knows? Everybody has their own prices, really. They all have their own prices. You make up your own mind. You're, you have your own price right now, right? Man, I can't. I hope, I hope this guy is spreading around this energy. 
This article is titled, Fed Governor Doesn't See a Recession. What? Now, listen, I'm going to say this. This is the one time where someone is wrong. <laughs> it might be a good thing. This is Christopher Waller once again. Am I... Am I doing something wrong by beginning to actually like this federal representative? I don't really like these type of individuals too much, but he's been saying a lot that could be positive for us. It says Fed governor doesn't see a recession, but is open to jumbo jumbo rate cuts from the Fed itself, a Fed representative itself. Now, if you saw something I posted, others beg to differ. But this is coming from a federal representative. Like I said, I hope his energy is the dominant one within the Fed. If we get jumbo rate cuts like what he's suggesting, this could be huge. And no, I don't think. <laughs> Listen, I put out the members only video yesterday. I'm not going to give anything away. Go watch that video. Every video I put out is a key piece to the new financial system and you have to look at certain aspects of the legacy system to understand certain things. You just have to go check out that members only video. All right. Uh, but this could have a huge, huge. There's something. There's one variable. Once again, that variable is in that members only video. There's one huge variable that this could affect where that variable uh, is moved to. And it's not the obvious. I'll leave it at that. Let's go here to a little bit of a little bit of Bitcoin news today on this. Uh, I was going to say very beautiful Saturday is beautiful to me whenever it rains. You know, I don't like the cloudiness, but I love when it rains. I love when it rains, you know, and um, I haven't done it in a while, but I used to take long walks in the rain just by myself. I do what I want. I march to the beat of my own drum. I, I go out there and I walk by myself uh, in the rain and just let the rain hit me. And it's so refreshing, you know, Um you haven't haven't tried that. I'm not recommending it. It's not advice, but I think it does a lot of people good to let that rain just pour over you sometimes. Um, and that's the kind of day in my area is, is looking like today. So um, that's beautiful to me, but a lot of people don't find that beautiful. So now Bitcoin usually suffers in September, but October is right around the corner. October. I like the sound of that. Let that price go up. Bitcoin's price has been historically weak this month. You know, it's crazy. You ever have someone say something, then you remember the same thing. And now that they've said this, I remember I'm thinking back to myself and I'm saying, wait a minute. I do remember September's sucked for lack of a better word. I remember this now. It's all coming back to me, right? And then like I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself also like, man, I wish I would have remembered that on my own. <laughs> I could take credit for that. Like, yeah, I said, but uh, hey, man, listen, shout out to decrypt.co. Yeah, no, they're right. I do remember September is being pretty harsh, you know, the last few, last few years from what I remember. But it says this, uh, Bitcoin's price has been historically weak this month, mirroring Wall Street's, quote, September effect. But brighter days are on the horizon. September has been historically a difficult month for U.S. stocks um, when it comes to the Bitcoin market. The so-called, quote, September effect, unquote, could be just a prevalent and the it says it could be just. I said just a prevalent. That was my fault. Just as prevalent and the performance of the price of Bitcoin of uh, this first week lends credence to this theory. Good verbiage article writer. Um the Wall Street phenomenon has been well documented for nearly a century. All right. Now, come on now. Let's get to the Bitcoin. Now I'm a Bitcoin holder. I have some stocks also, but I don't care about those right now. I let them collect dust. Bitcoin's track record is comparatively short. Those are long holes for me. I don't have to worry about them. However, the market has experienced noticeable weakness. Bitcoin it depends on what Bitcoin does. I don't know how long I'm going to hold this Bitcoin. If it goes up at some point, I'm moving that Bitcoin and taking a profit. 
Although I think Bitcoin has an extremely bright future even after, even after that. But I have other things. I'm not worried about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's track record is comparatively short. However, the market has experienced noticeable weakness during the first month of fall since 2013. Bitcoin's price has declined in September eight times, according to CoinGlass data. So, OK, so this is how it typically goes. The asset, which is interesting because everyone acts so surprised when the prices are, you know, rocky or go down, go down and. Oh, they're shocked by the data, which we already knew months in advance. I get, like I said, I think a lot of people just do it. It's just, it's, it's a way, it's a means of content, I suppose. And um, I think a lot of people's content is hinged on moving people's emotions up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, me, I'm just trying to just tell you what's on my mind from the research that I'm doing. That's it. That's just my way to each his own, right? The assets price has started this month with a more than 8% slide, outpacing an average drop of 5% over the past decade. September is one of only two months to average losses since 2013, with June the only other negative month with a minus 0.35% average price movement during the, that span. September is by far, by far Bitcoin's worst month over the last decade on average. Wow. Even though Bitcoin has exited September green only three times since 2013, Jake Ostrovsky's, an OTC trader at the market maker Wintermute, told Decrypt that the red trend is far from gospel. Whilst market likes to focus on the September effect, given its historical performance, the small sample size uh, makes it difficult to use as a leading indicator, unquote, he said pointing out that Bitcoin returned nearly 4% last September. Okay, interesting. All right. Listen, right now, Bitcoin has so many positive catalysts. I just don't see it staying down for long. I just don't. Um, and I think a lot of big money people know that. And that's why they're predicting all of these, you know, uh, high Bitcoin prices. Some, some of them saying by the end of this year, many of them saying by the end of this year, we shall see. Some of them saying early next year. To me, it really doesn't matter as long as Bitcoin goes up at some point in the next year or so like that. I think a lot of people will be sitting pretty, not financial advice, but I know I definitely will. Be. I'm already looking good from where Bitcoin was before when we grabbed some, when it was super duper low and people were saying people were saying crypto was dead back then. Didn't look too dead. Didn't do it look too dead. Then it went up and people celebrated. That's always the way it is. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I believe that, man, listen, with everything going on right now. You have the IMF backing off of Bitcoin. You have governments around the world embracing Bitcoin, banks around the world embracing Bitcoin and crypto. Crypto as a whole, once again, like I said, I just don't see how the future at some point isn't super bullish across the board. It just is until something changes my mind. I just don't see it right now. And the legacy system is doing terrible, absolutely terrible. I have three more articles we're not even going to get to. Matter of fact, I'm going to skip the Cardano article. I just want to show you. I'm going to show you this here, okay? We'll end off with this. I should have ended off with gold or something, but I'll end off with these two here. This is how bad they're doing. I said that this would continue because the bank system, the banking systems have been treating their workers terribly, overworking them, and this is causing a lot of dissension within, and they're they're going to have a lot of rogue rogue employees, right? That's what I said. Here's another one. JP Morgan Chase Insider drains customers accounts lifts twelve thousand nine hundred and forty eight dollars in cash from atms this is coming from a u.s bank regulator we've had countless incidents like this even from higher ups right stealing millions not just from jp morgan chase but like other banks as well this is they're all doing very very badly right now and that's going to cause increased deposit flight Customers are learning about this. The banking industry, the legacy system is doing very badly. They know it. They know it. It says the Office of Comptroller of Currency, OCC, says some, some individual. I'm not going to say their name. If you want to read their names, go to the article. A former Chase personal banker stole approximately $12,948 from the bank while serving as an ATM custodian in Miami, Florida. Now, let's go here. I mean, overall, everything that has to do with money in the legacy system has not been doing well. There's a trend. I think people, if they haven't already, should start asking themselves, is this on purpose? And I will say, yeah, I would venture to say yes, because I know how many brilliant people there are out there to hire that could solve these problems 
easily, easily, all right? We have brilliant minds on this planet that can come up with new systems like what you see with DLT. DLT is nothing compared to what could be, all right? It's just the next thing up. And yes, it's better than the legacy system. But what I'm saying is when you have errors like this, when you're, you're, you have your higher ups making these types of mistakes, it's on purpose because they want to bring down the house to build a new house. This article will close out on U.S. national debt explodes by six hundred and eighty four billion dollars in three months as Fitch warns America has failed to fix growing debt burden. And we all know what that growing debt burden is going to affect in the future, and it is not going to be good. They're trying, in my humble, humble opinion, and you could disagree, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. I say that all the time because some people like to argue for no reason. It doesn't get us anywhere. Um, it's good to have diverse array of thought, right? But they, if you want to institute a new system, you have to bring the old one down, especially if you want to institute a system where you're going to have maximum amount of control, more control than you ever had before. You're going to be, be able to make more capital than you've ever made before. You have to destroy the majority of the old system. You know, you, do, you tear down the house. Tear down the base of the house. You build a new base and you build a new house on top of it. Civilization after civilization has been built one on top of the other. Right now, if you dig below some of these cities in the U.S., you're going to see buildings below them. You dig in some of the old countries and you're going to see civilizations below that dirt. You're going to find buildings made out of stone, monolithic structures. This always happens, not just physically. It also happens when it comes to any type of mental construct that humans have as well. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, everybody, let's get to the money.